At Metro East, we know there's a lot of great work going on in our community, and we want to share that with you. On Community Hotline, we highlight local nonprofits, schools, and government agencies that have their feet on the ground and are working to make our neighborhoods a better place. Hello. For the past quarter of a century, Metro East Community Media has brought you information about local nonprofits, schools, and government agencies via our flagship program, Community Hotline. The guests who have appeared on our program have affected positive change and strengthened our community through the inspiring and necessary work they do. We've been proud to shine a spotlight on some extraordinary organizations while giving them the platform to tell their story, to find volunteers, and perhaps some donations. Community Hotline has let people in your neighborhood find out how to access needed resources or to hear from school leaders or discover opportunities to become civically engaged with local government. Now, after almost 25 years of broadcast on cable TV, Community Hotline is going on indefinite hiatus. It's been a great ride. From both director and co-producer Emily Vidal and myself, we'd like to thank you for joining us. As this is our last program for the foreseeable future, we're going to shine that spotlight on community media. We'll start by talking to Antoine Haywood, a PhD student at the Annenberg School of Communications in Pennsylvania, about the important role that community media has to play throughout the country. Then we'll talk with one of our local partners, the Rosewood Initiative, about working with Metro East to bring digital literacy to immigrant and refugee communities right here in East County. And finally, we'll talk to Metro East Deputy Director John Lugton about some of the ways we've adapted our services to continue serving the community through the pandemic. It's all coming up next on Community Hotline. Community media got its start in the 1970s, ensuring that access to media technology, training, and tools were available to everyone. The media landscape has changed dramatically since then, but the principles of free speech and digital equity and inclusion are just as important. On this segment of Community Hotline, we'll talk to Antoine Haywood, whose research focuses on the contemporary relevance of community media centers like Metro East. I kind of ask you here today because of your experience with community media, um, your, your really high level involvement with the Alliance for Community Media, and then the fact that you're pursuing your PhD in communication, it all kind of ties in. So I think uh, you, you might have a, a nice perspective on, on what's going on in this industry. Um, so can you tell me, first of all, how did you come to community media in the first place and, and how old were you at the time? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. I was, oh man, was I uh, 22, 23? Okay. <laughs> a, okay. In my um in my my early twenties, and um so that was about 20, 20 years ago now. So I'm I'm forty two, going on forty three, and I got involved um just as I graduated uh, after I graduated from uh, Morehouse College in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. uh, I began <clears throat> um working as a museum fellow at the Atlanta History Center, and while I was doing my fellowship there, I was introduced to Allison Fussell who was um, the director at the time of People TV. And that was the, the that still is uh, the nonprofit organization that manages the public access TV channel for the, for the city of Atlanta. And she's like, oh, I heard that you're all, you're interested in media and we've got this youth program. We're starting this thing called the youth channel. Would you like to volunteer and be on the, on the advisory council? I was like, sure, you know? And I tell you the, the first, the instant I walked through the door at People TV, I knew I was like home. It was really? something about, it was just very, very clear. Um, and it's like, I don't have too many of those um, moments in my life, you know, <laughs> where it's like, you, but it's, but you have them, you know, people yeah, have, yeah. it's just like, it's really like, I am meant to be here. I wasn't expected, like, I didn't expect this to be a thing, but it is a thing and it just makes sense and go with this. Monica, it just it literally changed my life in that trajectory I was all about, I was going to be this, this independent documentary filmmaker like Spike Lee. I was going to go to New York. Like I had this whole thing like mapped out, right? Uh -huh. And the minute I stepped foot into People TV's doors and Ben Hill Rec Center, I was like, I'm, I'm community media. Like this is, this is it, you know? Community media was founded on, on principles of um, free speech and democracy and civic engagement. Do you still find that that's the case these days from, from what you experienced there and, and what you see now? Has yeah, I mean, I, I, it, there's still, um, you know, pillars in terms of like the values of, mm -hmm. of community media. Um, I think that one thing that has become 
a little bit more um, in the foreground in terms of what practitioners, um, and I, I refer to, you know, folks like yourself, um, folks like myself as practitioners. Right. Like, you know, we actually, there's, there's practice in this. And there's, there's the day in and the day out of figuring out, you know, putting out the fires and how can we make this class better? How can we better engage communities? And so, and that, to that point, community engagement, I think, and that's, that's, that's the work that I did professionally um, at People TV and uh, Philly Cam, um, that's the, the, the access operation up here, um, is so, you know, there is free speech and there is democratic communication, right? Um, and I think those are, that's the, the, those are the roots, right, of, mm -hmm. of, of, of community media um, in, in community access television. But um, I think there's more now is, is the community engagement piece that's wow. in, that, that, that people are developing and practicing and figuring out how do we get this better and how do we put that more to the forefront. You, have you seen instances in, in, your, in your years as a, a, in community media where you've actually seen that it's made an impact on the community? Oh, you, yeah. I mean, that, that, that's why I said I'm, I'm getting a PhD. I, there's also the, the things that happen um, that are more so about the relationships of in the, the space that the community media uh, center holds for people. It's very transformative and it's something that I'm trying to like uplift in my work that, you know, yeah, there's one thing of people's lives have been transformed as they've gone through um, the, the process of production. And, but then there's like also transformation in the relationships that people build in like the centers and places like Metro East, right? Yeah. They can facilitate things like local journalism, which is in crisis, you know, right, but, right. you know, they also, there are places that, where people can come and they actually like work on healing themselves, right? You know, they've, 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 they've experienced some kind of trauma and whether or not they disclose this when they come through the door or not, some people do, some people don't. Um, and this is just the kind of, and it's from my, I've gotten a lot of this because I was, you know, the community engagement director and the youth program yeah, coordinator, right, right. you know, yeah. I'll tell this to everyone when I talk about like the, what makes our work special is that people bring their whole selves through the door, <laughs> as you yes, know, yes, yes. <laughs> like you they find bring, out a lot about people, you find out a lot about people. I've had some young people who had issues at home and mm -hmm. that wasn't fully disclosed and coming to um, like people TV and coming to Philly cam, they, those were safe spaces for those young people. Yeah. And, and there they were ways for, they and, could be and, themselves and they can, then they could also, they could work through, they could build relationships with their peers that weren't mediated in ways by abusive parents, which right. is what has happened, you know? So all of this is, this is, you know, that's, yeah, this is the what community I'm, part of, it's the of community, community part of it. Media. Yeah. Real, real talk. And this is, this is what my research is getting at, you know, of it's, it's way, way more nuanced and way more, more, you know, deeper than, you know, somebody putting on a talk show about like how to do, you know, repair cars. I've had seniors who've gone through all sorts of stuff in their lives and then they've come through and, this, and they said, this has just saved me, you know, it saved yeah. me to be able to come here and do that and, and have these people supportive of me and, and totally. be able to share yeah. my life yeah. and however they do it. Yeah. It's, and it's even just important. to hear like a simple yes, you know, one of the reasons why I opted to, I feel like it was a good time for me to transition into, um, you know, becoming a scholar, you know, becoming a researcher is to, to contribute because I, I see that that is so important and I want to do whatever I can to do to help to tell the story. It's, you know, free speech week this month. It's community media day on October 20th. And yep. it just seemed like a good time to talk about what it is we do and, and why it's important. You know, and I also, I, I constantly, you know, I remind people to that, the, the, that, the media makers, the local storytellers who engaged in community uh, media at, at places like Metro East, you know, the majority of the folks are doing it voluntarily, you know, mm -hmm. and that there's a lot to be said for that. Folks are doing, they're doing this voluntarily. And you have some yeah. people who've been doing it for 20 years. Plus, That's right. They've got it down. <laughs> they've got it down, you know, yeah. there's something very important there. In order for you to volunteer your time, you know, there's, there's something very deep, profound, <laughs> that is like compelling you. It's not for mere vanity sake. I kind of push back at anything that kind of like, you know, may pass judgment. Yeah. I mean, there are, we've had, we had programs at, at People TV that, yeah, it was, it's a lot of vanity. I mean, what's interesting is like people may have come to the door because of their vanity and all of a sudden it got, it changed for them. 
right. because of the community aspect, you right. know? Right. And so, and then they go from like, well, yeah, I was just all allured by being on TV, but this is something else, you know? And they mm -hmm. may have had some interaction with the guest that came on the program or somebody said something to them when they were out in the community about they saw their program or heard their program wow. and how it impacted their life. Like then, it, then, then it's like, wow, this isn't just about me my face on it gets or real this is it gets yeah. real you know? yeah <laughs> <laughs> and, and that and that change and I think that's that's the thing that I mean that's for me like that's the magic of it yeah right yeah. you know and you feel like you've you've done something that made a positive contribution to your community you, you've right. actually done something that's yeah you know that yeah. matters I see community media as like an act of care like it's a caring it's a as a caring mm -hmm. act they express care through the programs that they make you know when they have people at, you know come in there, there have so many shows that in the before times when we could all sit down and eat together, you know, right. people would people would feed their guests. You did a lot of work on finding out how community media uh, survived or is surviving. The pandemic. Yeah, yeah. What yeah. are what are what were the big conclusions that you came from out of that? Yeah, so we had um, uh, first I have to acknowledge uh, my collaborators, uh, Dr. Uh, Patricia Ofterhide at American University and um, uh, Mariana um, Sanchez uh, Santos, uh, we worked together to, um, we did a study on how PEG operations responded to, um, to the pandemic and the onset of the, the pandemic. And um, what we found were, were three, three things. PEG is the public education mm -hmm. and government part of right. the community media. Yeah, so what we found is that, um, you know, the, the community media, um, staffers they you know use the technical expertise um mm -hmm. to connect people so to make to help um government officials to help um public safety departments um even seniors individual members in the community transition to virtual life um the second thing that we we saw was that um peg played a role pegs played a role as uh, news and information providers so out in akuku they actually had you know people with you know they taught people virtually how to use their cell phones how to become like stringers and they were you know feeding in these like small stories to yeah. to um to the to the facility to the station and they were putting together a regular um you know the maui daily like a regular show and so right. um yeah and so that so you had that um happening and then the third thing is that um, you know, Peg Community Media facilitated like public virtual public rituals, you know, which is very important when people were in isolation. Um, they were still able to participate in like flag ceremonies and Memorial Day um, because of we had the technology and the infrastructure was already there. These rich public rituals, which and especially in your smaller tighter knit communities mm -hmm. are very very important for people every year they go to the the veterans parade the memorial parade and graduations right so that's another very important right. public ritual and so pegs are already pegs do and a lot of pegs do graduations anyways mm -hmm. so all of it was set up and ready when pivoting was like well how are we going to do graduations like we can't and it was like well it's already wired yeah. We just need to reconfigure how we do it. People you know? have been isolated like we had been. It is yeah. very difficult. And for some people more than others, but being able to connect that way is, you know. Yeah. It's so it's help. very, yeah. I mean, I, I choked up because I'm like, it's very moving because it's like, you know, this is what we do. This is what yeah. community does and facilitates connect people. Yeah. and connect people. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, so yeah, it was just a perfect opportunity to, um, to conduct a study. And we've done an academic journal article, yeah. Yeah. Um, but there's a public facing um, report that okay. uh, the Center for Media and Social Change out of American University um, is that's that's where we published the the public report for and um so it's it's you don't get all the academic mumbo jumbo it's just <laughs> Make it here's, easier to read, huh? here's what we did you know yeah, yeah, yeah. Cut it <laughs> here's down what we saw day. here's yeah. here are the points you know um here's here were opportunities you know we also talking about opportunities um for for where policy um can can come in but we do need to figure out how what are some other ways that this can be publicly supported why we should have continue to advocate for a Metro East to continue to exist, you know, and, and have the support. <laughs> so yeah. one last question, what do you see as the future? Is there any big thing you think see in the future of community media that we haven't touched on? Golly, I mean, I think that there is really something um, in the direction of like local journalism and participatory 
great journalism. I mean, and then I also think, I mean, going back to even the technical expertise, you know, people, there's always this question of like, well, why, why do we need something like a Metro East or a Philly cam or Davis Media Access when we have YouTube and all these platforms that do, right. da, 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 da. but, you know, as you clearly see in the pandemic, right, you know, like YouTube didn't help, you know, whatever township council get onto the platform right, to start right. streaming you need and if you the, don't know how to use those things for in the first place then what's the yeah but having people on the ground too who like who are connected to the communities um mm -hmm. that understand the intricacies of like the local politics and culture and the social dynamics you know just this whole like doing local well um and i think that there's less and less if you look at the broad national like media scape that does focus on and even value at an argue local. Well, Antoine, thank you so much for being with us and taking the time today. I know you're very busy and, and, uh, I, and I wish you the best of luck in, in your studies. And uh, I know you're gonna just, I know you'll be out there and I'll be seeing yeah. you all over the place, you know, <laughs> doing your talks and whatnot. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I yeah. really enjoyed this. So um, let's, you know, keep people uh, in the know about Community Media Day that, you know, this is, you know, spread the word about what a good thing this is. Absolutely, absolutely, and I'm I'm glad like we we managed you know we kept it going you know yeah me too me too um, so and I'm looking forward to uh, many more years of just celebrating um, Community Media Day yeah sounds good thank you so much Antoine alrighty you take care thank to you. our viewers out there thank you so much for watching and um, do check it out check out uh, the websites of your local community media station thanks. Rapid advancements in digital technology have created large gaps in many communities, often called the digital divide. On this segment of Community Hotline, we'll be talking to Abida Jamaluddin about how the Rosewood Initiative is working with Metro East to bridge this digital divide with media classes for refugee populations. Our show today is focusing on community media, and I've invited you because I think you can give us a little bit different perspective than maybe some others have on, on what that means to them. Um, but first, before we get to that, can you tell me briefly about, about where you're from and when you came to the United States and how that experience has kind of been? I'm from Burma. My father from the Arkan state, everybody know as a Rohingya. Yeah, so I'm a Rohingya woman. I left my country uh, 2004 to Malaysia. So I came to US from Malaysia as a refugee 2016, January 15. So I, I'm very um, impressed by your bravery to come here. And there's, a, there's quite a group of, of Rohingyans that are, are here in the Portland area. I'm so lucky I have here one cousin who helped me a lot of everything. Like uh, he welcomed me from the airport everything he helping me so i don't have to go many time like uh, other people after one year i um i feel like uh, i want to help people like i know i am i am uh, high school educate i saw here many ethnic city like the chain chain moon so those people are really weak more than me so this is first step I volunteer at the Midway uh, Division. Then I met um, Nancy, who are working at the Rosso Initiative. This is my lucky person who made me today. You met me. So then uh, first, uh, Nancy told me that, are you willing to volunteer for Jessica computer class? So I have some knowledge and I am willing to help in my own community. So I start volunteer at the Rosso Initiative. Then after one year, Nancy say, hey, are you willing to work at the Rosso? So this is my lucky time. So I start working to 2020. You came to the Rosewood Initiative and the Rosewood has been a partner of Metro East Community Medias for off and on for several years. And we, we appreciate what they do. They're a community center kind of right in, on the border between Gresham and, and Portland, 
right? Yes. And, and so they, they're a great place to come for, for people to gather and to meet their neighbors and to learn things, a lot of different programs there. Rosso Initiative is the main area for our community, Good. main center. Before we are struggling, like after you are a refugee, you came here after three months, you don't know how to, where to go, how to apply the, you know, food stamp and renewing your insurance. So me also struggling those things a little bit. But uh, when you know there is a community center, we can go, we can meet a different nationality, different country people. We made, we make a new friends. Their hope is all refugee come together here, get to know each other. And we are happy to live in America. We start to try to involve in America culture. So this is, yeah, the main thing. So our Russell initiative is not only the computer class or English uh, citizen class, there are many different things also. If you want to, uh, I think there is challenging when you, uh, when is the COVID, you have to study from online. So Rosso Initiative are uh, distribution, the Chromebook, iPad, people are senior, they are providing for, so they also navigate how to use. This is the one thing we really important for our people. Some people are, they don't even know how to take a picture and send it to you. So after we have a digital class, digital literacy, computer class, so they know how to use in the Zoom and how to use in the computer, laptop, and your uh, mobile. So many things, they get benefit. Our community people are getting benefit from the Rosso Initiative. Also, they are navigate resources, connection with the other resource, wraparound service. I think we are so lucky to get to know Rosewood and we now we know how many resources we can connect. How did Metro East come into this and what, what have they been able to do for you at Rosewood as far as uh, increasing your learning and, and your education? They came to uh, teaching the Rohingya community and Burmese um, English, uh, computer literacy. And then uh, Nancy asking me, are you willing to help? So I will pay you money. But I say, Nancy, no, Nancy. You hear many white people, many organizations are helping our community. Why not we are helping each other? Then I don't take any money. But we have a computer class at the Rosswood. Then we give it to, after this class done, we give everybody to uh, continually learn. So they give the ThinkPack computer for each person. So because of the Metro is a uh, computer class, many people have a skill, you know, how to make a, a Gmail, how to mm -hmm. open the Zoom, how to take in video, uh, how to take in pictures. Many people can use a little easier. Many people are improving their digital skills. Everything pretty much is online, especially through COVID. So it's been very important for people to know how to use the computer. I think it would be very difficult to do anything really if, if without it. That's why this is very important for everybody to know how to use in the digital. Mm -hmm. And uh, also in person teaching in the class is most important for. Yes, it does make a difference. I mean, we can learn a lot online, but being there in person and connecting with people yeah. is probably. Yeah, Jessica computer class in person, so she can show how to go, how to click, how to uh, search in the Google. Today I have a, I can say is my, I can work at the Rosso initiative, but first step is computer class. So today also you are in, interviewing me because of the digital, you know, this yeah, is an yes, amazing I, thing. Yes, I, yes, I wanted to know how, how it changed your life or how that, how that helps you to, to get along. And it sounds like it does. It sounds like it does. And, and then you're sharing it with others, which is wonderful. So thank you so Thanks much, Abita. So
Thank you so Thank much. You. I appreciate your, your time here today and, and continue doing what you're doing. You're doing a great job. And I, I know that a lot of people look up to you in your community. So I'm proud, yes, proud of that. Thank you, Monica. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, you take so care much for Thank everybody. You. Thank you. And thanks for watching uh, this episode of Community Hotline. And please, if you don't know about the Rosewood Center, check it out or you can support it because they can always yeah, use it. Yeah, Rosewood Initiative is a great place for all the community. Thank you so much. Thank you. Here at Metro East, local schools, nonprofits, and governments rely on us as an essential service provider and partner. With the onset of the pandemic, we've had to creatively adapt our services to support our community partners. On this segment of Community Hotline, we'll talk to Metro East Head of Production and Deputy Director John Lugton about some of the new and innovative productions we've been working on since the onset of COVID. Thanks for being here, John. Thanks for having me, Monica. You're welcome. Um, so I wanted to get right into it by talking about a, a video that you recently made, uh, you and your production team, about the right of way. I understand your team won a national award from NATOA for that particular video. Yeah, that's absolutely, absolutely right. It's very exciting. Um, we haven't won that many NATOAs in the past, um, but winning one is just an amazing honor because it is at the national level. Um, the right away video we've made in partnership with the Office for Community Technology. Um, they're part of the city of Portland. And the video is really about explaining the public right of way. And I say public because you know, we actually own the right of way and therefore like the city of Portland is managing it on our behalf. So when people want to put utilities into the right of way, they have to be in negotiation with the city and therefore they're paying a fee to use the right of way. And that money is really, really valuable, not only to us as a community media center, but actually to the city of Portland, city of Gresham, Troutdale, Wood Village, Fairview, you name it. All right. So, so this explains, so the video explains it. How, how does that tie into Metro East Community Media? Why is that relevant to us? Well, the Office for Community Technology are a big part of our work through their association with the MHCRC. And um, they have a really big um, initiative, uh, digital equity and inclusion. And as you know, because we're out here in East County and have a couple of the most diverse zip codes in the whole state, um, we have been able to work with partners and go in to do things like our introduction um, to computers class. And we're also a big part of what the Office for uh, Community Technology does, or OCT, is the broadband incentives to make sure as many people can be digitally connected as is possible. And we all know I mean, how vital that is. I mean, you can't apply for a job literally without being having the internet or anything like that. March of last year, when, when COVID happened and the urgency of, you know, getting technology, getting online, da, 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 it was it was so present. And yeah, okay. you're right. We were able to, to be there and meet some of those challenges. If people want to see the, the uh, full video, it, it is available on our website, but I think we can show a little, uh, little snippet of it now. That'd be great. Access to communications technology has never been more vital, especially for our residents who are experiencing economic instability. Through the Broadband and Digital Equity Program, OCT collaborates with businesses, nonprofits, schools, the library system, and the county to make computers and broadband service available to everyone, especially our most vulnerable populations and those who have suffered the effects of systemic racism to ensure that everyone benefits from access to the internet. John, one of the things we talked about was COVID and how that affected you know, our industry and everyone else. Uh, how, how did Metro East handle that? What, what, uh, what did you do differently to deal with COVID when, you know, when it hit our, our community? That is just an incredible question. Um, just to put it into perspective, you know, we cover probably in excess of 200 government meetings a year. That's a lot. Uh, so, that's a lot. yeah. So that's nearly two thirds of our evenings are spent covering government meetings. But we were able to move really, really quickly. 
um, we just suddenly were able to work it out. And we, you know, our team, Keith, Lauren, they jumped in, they worked out a technology solution that basically enabled us to take the stream that we were getting. Now you gotta remember, March of last year, Zoom was a completely new thing for many people. And we managed to latch onto that. I don't believe we lost any meetings. We just kept going forward. There was no interruption to service. And what was more important about that was there was a lot of decisions that were getting made at the local level about how people were responding to COVID in our communities that was really vital for us to be able to keep on people's radar. And having that channel that's dedicated to, the, to, to basically just municipal government is just a fantastic opportunity to folks for folks to see what's going on in their own backyard. And, uh, and that's really important. That's, uh, you know, civic engagement is huge. And for us to be able to keep that going was really, really important. What other kinds of things uh, do we do at Metro East that, that were impacted by COVID and that you had to make a change? Well, a real good fun story, um, again, from the early days um, when it was the wild west of Zoom, um, was we partner um, with the League of Women Voters um, of Portland to provide, you know, um, election coverage. And of course, we had a we had a primary election going on. We ended up doing something like sixty five Zoom interviews within like a month of of COVID having happened. In many instances, this was the candidate's only opportunity to do anything for the public. And we had an incredible uh, viewership on those. And we worked really hard on the channels, again, to make sure that you could see these interviews, you knew which candidate was coming up next. So we did lots of things to try and enhance the viewing experience so as as many people as possible um, could see these interviews. Uh, so people were engaged and they were connected. There are, uh, you work a lot with nonprofits as well, correct? So how... How do you work with them and how, how did that change? I know you've done videos, a lot of videos in the past for nonprofits. What kinds of things did you do for them at, during COVID? Well, during COVID, essentially to begin with, you know, it was just one cancellation after another. But then, you know, I think we regrouped really quickly. Um, and I think they started to think differently. And after a couple of weeks, we reached out to a lot of our regular clients and just let them know that we were there and let them know that we were still gonna try and make video, um, but it might be slightly different. Yeah. And then we had worked on a project with Oregon Ask, who had wanted to work with another group called My Voice Music. And then we got a call from My Voice Music, kind of like, could you do a virtual fundraiser? We were kind of like virtual fundraiser. <laughs> Who's never that? heard of that? <laughs> yeah, and all of a sudden we were kind of in this world of like, well, we have a 1600 square foot studio and it's really just producing a television show, but we stream it. And so it was more, I mean, the, the actual show completely in our, our basket, completely something we can do. The streaming is a whole other, whole other avenue. Um, it went really well. It was very successful. We learned a lot. Um, and they've come back several times since. Um, we worked with um, several other organizations, Elevate Oregon. We worked with them, did their fund fundraiser, Restore Oregon, Metropolitan Youth Symphony, my, my fa father's house. I mean, we, we worked with a bunch of groups. And what's really amazing is you get to form this relationship with them. You get to find out about their community. And you really get to see what they're out there doing. And at a stage, yeah, we're all wearing masks and we're all smelling a hand sanitizer. But you know what? We we kind of came together in the in the common good of like, you know, they need to do a fundraiser. We also build community. I mean, we are, you know, we're not just about video. Yeah, it's something we excel at, but that brings us all together. I mean, it brings us together as a staff. I mean, it brings us together with everybody we work with. People, members of the public come in and take our classes to do all this amazing stuff. But really what we're doing underneath is we're building this incredible community. You only need to look at the range of programming that you see on our channels to realize, we're, you know, it's like, whoa, there's a lot of different perspectives out there. But we're yeah. managing to get a lot of those on the channels, which is fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's about free speech and you're, you know, people getting their voices heard and, and we're giving people a, a platform to do that, that 
otherwise they would not have. The work we're doing is so based in our community, mm -hmm. so based in the people that we believe we should be serving. And I really think that that's where we kind of elevate ourselves amongst those organizations across the country is because, you know, we're really proud of what we do. And, you know, you only need to go and meet some of our, our folks who've learned to use a computer for the first time. And you just get that goosebumpy glow going where you're just like, yeah, this, this, this is why I do this job. I'd say mm -hmm. if people have any question about whether or not they should support community media, I think listening to you talk about it, they, they get a good feel for what we're doing. And, and it is important. It's, it's something that we would all miss dearly if we did not have that. Absolutely. Thanks so much for your time today, John. I appreciate it. Thank you, Monica. Uh, and thanks to our viewers for watching today. Do check out our website and find out more about community media. I'm Monica Weitzel. Until next time. Thank you for joining us for our last Community Hotline program before the show goes on hiatus. At this time, I'll also be retiring from Metro East Community Media and as the host and co-producer of Community Hotline. Working on this show has been the highlight of my professional career. I cherish the friendship I've made with past crew members, most of whom were volunteers, and especially with Emily Vidal, the director and my co-producer in the show. Her professionalism and dedication to her craft has been an inspiration, and we've had some really fun times along the way. I'd be remiss if I did not also give a special thanks to John Lugton for his support and to Marty Jones for recognizing the value of this program. Thank you to the many guests we've had in over 1,200 episodes over the past 25 years. Their work lets me know that there are many, many individuals and organizations, schools and government groups working hard behind the scenes to make our lives the best they can be. Thank you to our sponsors and to Metro East for giving me the opportunity to host a television show. It's a lot more work than I imagined when I was nine years old speaking into my hairbrush in front of the bathroom mirror, but it was also more fun than I imagined. I will miss this very much, but I hope we've inspired people to volunteer, to get involved, and to make a difference no matter how small. It's been an honor and a privilege. I'm Monica Weitzel, signing off. Hold on, hold on, Monica. <laughs> hold on. Hang on there. Oh my God. I, I too would be remiss, oh. my dear. And thank, thank you, you so much thank you, thank for you, so many you. episodes, for moving in being possibly the one and only host of Community <laughs> Hotline there ever has been, carrying the show forward. And honestly, this show has provided so many opportunities for nonprofits to get volunteers, to get their information out, and all because of you and Emily and everybody who's worked hard behind the scenes to bring Community Hotline to the wonderful viewing public. You're fantastic. Thank you, Thank you so Good much,